So, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, I work uh, at the Department of Internal Medicine at the University Hospital in, of North Norway uh, as a physician and a researcher. Now, our research group recently performed the first double-blind randomized controlled trial testing the efficiency of fecal transplantation in irritable bowel syndrome. And I was the P or I am the PhD student in, the, in this project. Now, because of positive results in this trial, overlap of symptoms between IBS and CFSME, and characterizational studies pointing towards the involvement of the microbiota in both, we were granted by the Norwegian Research Council to perform the first double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial testing the efficiency of fecal transplantation in CFSME. Uh, now, IBS, IBS and uh, CFSME are both, both uh, disabling diseases with an impaired quality of life. There are no biomarkers for uh, symptom monitoring or for uh, the di diagnosis making. And uh, diagnosis is based on patient, patient's perceived symptoms. Now, we all know the symptoms in CFSME. The main characteristics of IBS is uh, abdom abdominal pain associated, associated with change in bowel habits. Uh, uh, down to the right are the names of the researchers involved in the IBS trial or, and that will be involved in the CFS trial. There are two names I want to highlight. First, my supervisor in the IBS trial, Rasmus Gold, and the PhD student that is going to perform the clinical study, Lynn Schavlin Karlbecke. She is the one that will inform about progress in the trial and present the main results when we have them. Now, fecal microbiota transplantation, FMT, is the infusion of feces from a healthy donor to the gastrointestinal tract of a recipient patient in order to treat a specific disease associated with alteration of gut microbiota. It's been used for 50 years in the treatment of toxin-producing um, recurrent Clostridium difficile, but it's not until recent year it's become a part of the guidelines in the treatment of Clostridium. Any other indications uh, where the FMT is used is considered experimental treatment. Transplant can be delivered to the upper or the lower part of the gastrointestinal tractus, uh, normally through the working channel of an endoscope, but an uh, enema technique may also be used. However, this is less common. So, there's a growing interest for FMT uh, <laughs> among patients and in the news media. <laughs> There's even a trend towards a commercialization of uh, experimental FMT treat treatment. Now, I know there's one clinic in Norway that offers FMT for IBS, and I know there's one clinic in U the UK that claims to have given more than 10,000 FMTs since two 2009 on various uh, indications, including IBS and CFSME. Patients may, e may even find instructions on how to do a home stool prep stool transplant on Google or YouTube. On YouTube, the instructors provide the viewers uh, uh, on how they can pour, perform the enema technique using simple kitchen equipment while they tell about their success history in the use of FMT. Now, the Norwegian Department of Health recommends the screening for the same screening for FMT donors as for donors of cells of uh, blood uh, tissue. Uh, yeah, of, yeah. So I can understand that patients are interested in this treatment, considering there are not any really good other treatment options. However, this enthusiasm needs to be balanced with caution in the use of this treatment. FMT can be a potent treatment. There are no more than 200 registered trials testing the effect of uh, fecal transplantation on various diseases. FMT is used uh, to target the immune system, the metabolism, genes uh, for antibiotic resistance, and the CNS. As an example of targeting the immune system, 
A review assessing the effect of fecal transplantation in this ulcerative colitis identified four placebo, uh, double blind placebo controlled randomized trials testing the effect. All four trials had highly clinically relevant endpoints, and three out of four came out with a positive result. Now, there's a symptom overlap between IBS and CFS ME. A Swedish study with 160 patients found 90% of IBS patients to experience fatigue. And the fatigue was assessed by the same questionnaire we used in our IBS trial. In CFS ME, more than 90% is found to experience IBS in their lifetime history, while more than 50% have concurrent IBS. And I forgot to say, in IBS, more than 50% uh, consider their fatigue to be one of the worst symptom in, uh, symptoms in their IBS disease. Now, uh, the involvement of the microbiota gut-brain axis is su suggested to be involved in the CFS and the IBS pathophysiology. The concept is that there's a bidirectional communication between the CMS and the microbiota to various signaling pathways. The CMS can influence the microbiota uh, by stress hormones uh, and influence the gut epithelial bar barrier and modulate the in immune response, while the microbiota can trigger the immune response to release anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory factors that can modulate the CNS. The microbiota can also influence that by releasing or triggering the release of new reactive molecules. Uh, yeah. So, in both IBS and CFS ME, an altered diversity and composition is found, an altered immune profile and alter center, central processing by measures of brain activity using fMRI. Now, these are all uh, characterizational studies. We don't know what is the cause and what is the effect, at least not in CFS ME. In IBS, targeting the microbiota by probiotics, antibiotics, change in diet, and fecal transplant has been shown to give relief of symptoms. <coughs> so, we performed the first uh, placebo-controlled randomized double. No, we performed the first double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial testing the effect of fecal transplantation in irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Ninety patients were assessed by the Roma three criteria and randomized to receive active or placebo treatment. Active was feces from uh, healthy donors screened by European consensus guidelines. Placebo was uh, patients receiving their own pre-processed feces back. Um, we did a 12-month uh, follow-up with a primary endpoint at uh, three months and the secondary endpoint at uh, 12 months. Uh, the transplant was uh, administered to the proximal part of the large intestine through the working channel of an endoscope. Uh, and here is the main uh, result. You can see uh, the proportion of responders um, that uh, experience relief in gastrointestinal complaints. 65% experienced uh, relief uh, in gastrointestinal complaints in the ACTA group versus 43 in the placebo group, placebo group at three months. And this is a significant result. Uh, we see difference between the groups at 12 months uh, too, but the result is not significant. Uh, we also measured the effect on fatigue. 60% experienced improve in fatigue versus 36 uh, in the placebo group. And this is also a significant uh, difference. And at 12 months, there was not a significant difference. We measured the quality of life. At three months, there's a significant difference, 56% improvement in the ACTA group versus 32 in the placebo group. Yeah. And that led to the comeback study. The hypothesis is that F CFS ME can be triggered by a dysbiosis in the fecal microbiome, and FMT can alleviate symptoms by restoring a healthy gut flora and cause symptoms, uh, sim symptom relief or remission of disease. 
we are not as confident in the result as the picture to the right might imply. Uh, okay, so here is the study design. 80 patients will be included by the Canadian criteria, randomized to receive active or placebo treatment. Active is, of course, feces from screened donors using European consensus guidelines. Placebo is participants receiving their own pre-processed feces back. We'll do a 12-month follow-up with a primary endpoint at three months, where the primary endpoint is changed in proportion of responders by the Chandler fatigue scale. Uh, the secondary endpoint at uh, 12 months is also changed in proportion of responders by the Chandler fatigue scale. We will also do a neuropsychological assessment at baseline and at three months to see if we can detect any changes caused by the intervention. And we will also see if uh, we can, if quality of life is uh, improved at three and uh, 12 months. Now, we know that diet, use of probiotics and medications can influence the gut microbiota. So, we will do a food frequency questionnaire and ask, also ask for the use of uh, probiotics and uh, use of medications to see if uh, changes may affect the results. We will also ob obtain feces, blood and urine at baseline and at 3 and 12 months that will be stored in a biobank for later uh, research with collaborators. Yes, the anima technique. So it's demonstrated on the pictures to the left. The person there is Frank Hilpersch. He's the creative fuel in the research group. You can see the full kit on the first picture. The second picture is the probe that it's, it's inserted to the rectum and the balloon that is inflated to prevent soiling. Uh, the bag empties, and then we tilt the table and ask the patient to lie on his left stomach and then his right. And then the transplant should be equally distributed throughout the col uh, colon. Because this is the same technique they use when uh, doing an x-ray of the colon. And you can see what lights up the colon is the contrast that is administered by the same, uh, same uh, kit and technique as we will use when uh, administering the fecal transplant. Yeah, uh, We have collaborations with Simon Carling at the Quadram Institute and Maureen Hansen at Cornell University. These are collaborations that can be uh, of particular interest if uh, we have a positive results on the patient reported outcomes. Mm. We might find in what uh, predicts the uh, effect in patients by uh, the data provided by Simon Carling with the sequencing of the microbiome. He will, uh, they will do both, uh, they will do sequencing of the microbiota, including the virome. And this can be interesting. In a trial testing the effect of uh, fecal transplantation in ulcerative colitis, it was just with seven pa patients, but they found the strongest predictor for a treatment response was low viral richness in the resident. Uh, Maureen Hansen has found LPS and soluble CD14 to be elevated in patients compared to healthy controls. And this might imply a rupture of the gut, disruption of the gut epithelial barrier. So we want to see if this might be a treatment marker for the, uh, a marker for, uh, to predict who benefits from treatment, or to see if uh, LPS and CD14 uh, decrease in responders, implying that they might have restored gut epithelial barrier by the intervention. Uh, we will do extensive biobanking of feces, urine, and blood. And these are for further investigations, um, for example, metabolomics. Yeah. And I think that was it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter. Any questions, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm an ME patient of long standing, 30, de uh, 30 years. Um, my ME doctor advised that um, FMT, there's a difference between FT and FMT. Uh, the clinic in the UK on performs FMT. FT is a very different thing. 
um, is just strictly stool that's sort of put through a CF FMT is quite, you, you could maybe explain the difference, but anyway. Um, I, he advised that I could try FMT, which I did. I actually had 36 over a course of 18 months. And my ME symptoms did resolve for a short time, but as he predicted, they returned. And he said this had happened with all the patients that had had the same treatment. Um, it's quite likely that I do have a viral infection because I, my ME started with an enterovirus, which I picked up in Egypt as I know in other ME patients, very similar stories. Um, but why, why the ME gut reverts to a sort of a dysfunctional type, that's the big question. Mm. Uh, thank you for sharing your story with the use of this treatment. Now, uh, we have an endpoint at three and 12 months to so that we uh, can see if there's effect at, uh, three one, uh, at three months and if the effect sustains. Now, uh, what's interesting with the uh, collaboration with Simon Carling is that we will also get data about the virome because we know that the microbiota can be modulated by uh, viruses. So if the problem is not in the bacteria but in the viruses, you might see a transient effect from the, from the bacteria that is transplanted. However, then you return back to uh, what uh, the microflora was before uh, the transplantation after modulation from the virus. This is just a speculation, but trying to give you some answer. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Here's one here. Um, in your MECFS study with your 80 patients, um, are they all going to have um, coexistent IBS, or you've got two groups, one with IBS and one without IBS? No, we will uh, do a block randomization stratifying on uh, duration and gender, not on uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, we will use the DePaul questionnaire that at least can tell us uh, if the patients experience gastrointestinal problems uh, or not and the intensity of them. And then we just have to hope that they will be equal distributed, distributed in the active and the placebo group. Okay, one other question. Yes, one up there. Are there any absolute contraindications for fecal transplantation? Uh, yeah, doing it uh, not in a study. <laughs> I just wondered whether you screen for parasites in the patients beforehand. Yeah, that's a part of the guidelines. Okay, well, many, many thanks, Peter, and good luck. Thank you. And the good work. Thank you very much.